It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. So one of the things that I've always talked to our kids when they're really, really struggling with friends, I can promise you that you are not the only person who feels like this. Oh, yeah. My Hang on, challenge. I'm supposed to be the parenting expert. You're blowing me away today. And now here's the stars of our show, my mum and dad. Every Tuesday on the Happy Families podcast, we dive into our inbox, podcasts at happyfamilies.com.au, and we carefully read your questions to see who we can help and how when it comes to the art and science of raising children. Hi, my name's Dr. Justin Coulson. I'm here with Kylie, my wife and mum to our six daughters. And Kylie, today we have a question that's come through from Karen who says, my 10-year-old daughter is having ongoing issues with her friends at school. Does this sound like a 10-year-old girl thing? (laughs) Yeah, I was just thinking, I don't think we've ever actually not had one of our children dealing with this. Yeah. It's such a challenge. It really is. So this is what she says. And what I might do, because normally I read the whole email and then we talk about it all at once. What I'm thinking it might be easier to do with this one is to actually sort of pull it apart as we go line by line and discuss different solutions and different realities as we go. So she says she feels her friends are being mean to her. They don't include her in the play. They single her out or they say she doesn't have cool stuff. And when I read that, I thought of all of the scientific research that shows the way that boys and girls play differently. We know that natal males and natal females just, they they interact in ways that are not the same. There's a fascinating study that I came across just recently where some researchers got a whole bunch of boys, there were 80 kids in total, and a whole bunch of girls, born boy, born girl, 40 of each, preschoolers, aged four to five, and divided them into either a boys group or a girls group. And then they asked them to watch a cartoon through a viewfinder. So you remember those old fashioned viewfinders where you'd put your eyes to it, then you click the click, click button and it would take you to the next scene and the next scene. And it was kind of like watching a slow motion animated cartoon. Just yeah. one yeah, one of those kinds of things, except the way the researchers rigged this up, really clever. They got kids into groups of four. They said only one person can look through the viewfinder at a time and they need your help. So this has turned into a co-op- cooperative process. One person had to turn the crank to make the viewfinder work and the other person had to press the switch for the light and hold that down so that it would work. Okay, so it was this really technologically um, complicated thing that needed a whole lot of manipulation. You've got one kid watching, one kid cranking the thing, and one kid pushing the switch for the light, all at opposite ends of the room. Oh, but hang on, there's four kids in the group. And you know what the fourth kid had to do? Nothing. They had to hang and wait for their turn to do something. And each of the four kids was going to get a chance at doing everything, but they're preschoolers. They're four and five years old, and they've got to figure out how they're going to do it together, how they're going to cooperate so that everyone gets a turn. And what the researchers found was that overall, the boys enjoyed it more than the girls. Just measuring how the kids were enjoying the process, boys had a lot more fun. They laughed more, they smiled more, and get this, they hit each other more. So they're having more fun, they're laughing and they're smiling, and they're hitting each other more because they want to be the one that gets to watch it now, or the one who gets to watch it next. In other words, they use their bodies a whole lot more than the girls. In fact, the researchers found that the boys pushed, pulled, or hit their partners about six times more than the girls did. <laughs> right? Like, this is a really physical interaction, but they had more fun. The girls were no less competitive. They were just a lot less direct. The girls made many more unfriendly commands, and they were also much more likely to be collaborative and share, whereas the boys weren't collaborative and sharing. It was kind of just a competition, like who have I got to destroy to get to do this thing? So while the boys used their bodies, the girls used their words. And there's all this research that's been around for so long that shows this relational versus physical male versus, oh sorry, female versus male thing. And that's what I get when I read this email, this first line. 
Her friends are mean to her. They don't include her in the play. They single her out. They say she doesn't have cool stuff. I mean, this is all status and hierarchy and relationships. And cons- it's heartbreaking to think that oh, at, 10, at 10, well, I mean, we're already dealing with this. Research shows it starts at four and five. But yeah. Yeah, by 10, this is where the comparison, the competition really mm. starts to ramp up as we lead into puberty. So Karen says, my daughter has a sensitive soul, so everything seems to hurt her. And I've noticed she gives her friends too much value. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that line and I thought, oh my goodness, friends are oxygen Mm. to all of our kids, but especially to our girls. And this idea of giving them value, I just, how hard is it for, even for us as adults to feel like we're enough? How hard is it for a 10 year old who's just discovering competition and comparison? How how, how are they supposed to know themselves and know their value on their own? They just give all their value away. They empower everyone else to allow them to feel things like that. So, And, And that's where I think the village is so important, you know, surrounding our kids with people who just love them absolutely love them and help them to see the contrast as they go throughout their day. You know, how do you feel like when you're in this space with these people? How do they make you feel comparatively to how these people are making you feel? It was interesting. We had a group of girls in our home at one point and I was blown away at the amount of manipulation I was witnessing by one girl in particular. Oh, right. My daughter was oblivious our daughter was oblivious. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> she was just, she was completely oblivious to it. And You're right. I had never seen it in such like just absolute vivid contrast to everyday conversations. And we talked about it the next day and I asked her if she'd noticed anything because it was, it was a really uh, emotionally challenging activity Mm -hmm. to have them all there Mm -hmm. and she said no no it's not like that anyway over the next few months she started to kind of open her eyes and see things in a slightly different way and she recognized over time that these people actually didn't make her feel good yeah yeah do i get to be myself when i'm around these people or do i have to keep on trying to prove that i'm one of them implicate somebody else's feelings to, mm. to 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 be able to be a part yep. of it and feel like you're a part of the whole. Yep. So I think that one of the things that I have found just so empowering for our kids is just really working on the village outside of school and surrounding them with people who just can love on them. Whether and it's the, the your local surf club or the sporting the group next door or neighbor. The, yeah, the neighbors, yeah, totally. Our, our yeah. nine year old has fallen in love with our neighbors. They're in their seventies. <laughs> yes. But to her, they're like her best friends. Yeah. And when she disappears, I say, Where have you been? Oh, I was just going to visit Diane and Chris and she goes and plays with the cat and the dog and gets a you know, a little treat and she just thinks it's the best. So let's move on with what Karen also had to say. She said, We've just moved location six months ago. And the excitement of the new school has now died and the issues are building up. She doesn't want to go to school now. She had similar issues in the old school. So now I know the problem lies with my daughter. Yeah, that's tricky. Well, I I read that and I I think that we need to challenge that assumption. I agree because we think that because we've been in one place for six months that the effects of the move have well and truly passed now. Mm, mm. And yet, just like she's acknowledged the, you know, the glitter and the sparkle of the new school and, and everything has started to wear off and you're no longer the novelty in the room because you're no longer the new kid. Somebody else is taking your place. Yeah, but the relationships haven't cemented. They're not even close. It, it takes years. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, so, sometimes, sometimes things really do just click, but quite often it takes a really long time for these relationships to evolve. When I heard that, I just thought, when we say something like, uh, so I, I now know the problem lies with my daughter, what we're unintentionally doing is inferring that our child is the problem and the child is not the problem. The child is never the problem. Rather, there is a problem to be solved and our child needs to be part of the problem-solving process. But nor are the other children. Right. Oh, of course. Do you know what I mean? We we yeah. can acknowledge that our child's the problem or they're the problem, but the reality is neither are. Yeah. We, we've got a situation where we've got two kids trying to navigate or more kids trying to navigate a really tricky situation. 
and space and time. They don't have the maturity. They don't have the understanding half the time. And so neither one of them the problem. So as we've worked through this email from Karen, we've already provided a handful of ideas and solutions. But what we need to talk about is the last thing that she's mentioned, because this is where we really dive into the solution frame. Karen says, how do I support her? I follow your tips. I provide a loving home so she feels she belongs. I listen. I don't try to fix, although sometimes I still try to by telling her to find new friends. How do I help her to build her resilience and to learn that friends are not everything, especially if they don't bring joy? Let's talk about how we can help our kids if they're struggling with friendships. When I talk to teachers in schools and I say, what are some of the most common challenges that you're dealing with? Friendships are at the top of the list all the time and particularly when it comes to girls. I've got a couple of things jotted down that I think can be useful solutions to help Karen and her 10-year-old daughter and any parent whose children are struggling with friendship issues. We've dealt with this endlessly, ongoingly with all of our six daughters at one point or another as they've struggled with friendships. Our kids need to know they have options. They need to know that they actually have a level of autonomy and control over what's going on. I love this. I've been in so many conversations where I've gone to that very word, optionality equals resilience. Like when you feel like you have no options, that's where helplessness comes in. That's where hopelessness comes in. But if you're in a situation that feels helpless and hopeless, and then you discover, hang on, I do have an option. All of a sudden, that's where you see that. That's what resilience is. It's about saying, oh, I have no pathways. Oh, hang on. I can create one. I can knock down these trees over here and smash through. I know that's not environmentally friendly, but I, <laughs> I can knock down these, these trees and blaze my own trail. That's resilience. It's having, I, I just, I love that you said that. And I love how clear you were on it. Optionality is key. And this is what happens with a 10 year old who feels like they have no friends. All too often, they feel like they have no options. What, what's amazing is that they're surrounded by people but all they can see is the one or two or three or four people in their friend group Mm -hmm. that they want to be friends with at all costs. You know, I've just had an insight and you've, you've, this was not pre-planned. It's literally just crashed into my head right now. I've never pretended that high school was a good experience for me. It was awful. And one of the main reasons that it was awful was I felt like I didn't have any friends. As I've reflected on this and, and I've had this thought a few times, but never so clearly as in the context that you've just provided it. My biggest problem when I was in high school was I wanted to be one of the cool kids and I desperately sought the cool kids approval and I never, ever got it because they knew that I so badly wanted to be one of them and they knew that therefore they could treat me however they wanted and I was never going to be one of them. But there were other people who I'm sure I could have been friends with but I never wanted to be their friend. I just wanted to be a cool kid. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happening with this 10-year-old. But, no, but, but we, I wasn't, we have blinders. I was not open to the option of that's being right. friends with anyone else. I had to be friends with, I'm not going to mention their names, but because who knows, maybe they're listening to the Happy Fam- Family Podcast today. <laughs> but I just had to be friends with them and they didn't want to be friends with me and I couldn't see any other option. I mean, it was just tragic. So one of the things that I've always talked to our kids when they're really, really struggling with friends, I can promise you that you are not the only person who feels like this. Oh, yeah. So my Hang on, challenge, I'm supposed to be the parenting expert. You're blowing me away today. This my is challenge to them <laughs> is to go and find somebody who's sitting on their own. Yeah. Someone who doesn't have friends. And there will be plenty of kids in your school playground who are sitting on their own, who don't have anyone to hang out with. The challenge we have is that they, again, have the blinders and they just want to be- I want to be friends with this them. This friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and just on that optionality as well, something else that we've got pretty good science around, you were talking before about wanting to be in control. Kids don't want to hear our options. So if I've got a child who's really struggling, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to have a conversation with them that says, I know you're struggling. What options do you see? Well, that was the the next thing on my list. So when we talk to our kids in this situation, I think the most important thing for them to know is that every option is on the table. We'll talk about it all. You want to move schools? Let's talk about it. We've done that with our children a number of times. We've said to them, are you where you need to be? Is this the right school? Now, we didn't want to move them, but it we decided that we were going to let them make the call. And pretty much every time they've said, no, 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 I need to stay here because if I go somewhere else. They've acknowledged that it's not necessarily going to be any better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that 
this is this is a situation that they just need to work through. But because we've given them that option, they feel heard, they feel validated, and they're able to actually open up to other possibilities. Yeah, because they sort of go, yeah, no, moving school isn't going to work. I need to stay here. It's a really, really powerful thing. So giving them giving them the opportunity to develop their own options. And also when they say, I don't have any, saying, okay, well, that's fine. I, I can think of a couple. Would you like to play around with those ideas? And be okay with them saying, I don't like that idea when you share it with them. Like They don't have to take any of your ideas. No. But it's about recognizing that there are options. Yeah. And let's talk through through them. They're much more likely to hear your options though once you've given them a chance to share all of their options with you. Like once they've said, I've got this option, this option, and this option, now I'm out of options, they're much more likely to listen to your options and say, hmm, there's an idea. Or they might say no because they feel helpless and hopeless, but there are all kinds of other things that are available. Yeah, so most schools will have lunchtime clubs, um, activities in the library, um, you know, different things that your children can get involved in that don't necessarily... Uh, fit the, the the mold, and very often our kids don't see them as options because their friends aren't going there, or the people that they want to be friends with. Yeah, Karen's wish for her child is that she will find joy, and if, as parents, we can help our children recognize joy in their relationships, they'll be better able to find that. Yeah. Okay, uh, a couple of other ideas. We have contacted teachers in the past with our children's permission and asked the teacher to send an email around to parents just saying, we have somebody who moved into the school a couple of months ago. Uh, they've got a child who's still having a few struggles, um, 10-year-old girl, 10-year-old boy, whatever it is. Um, if you have a child who you think would be willing to have a play date on the weekend or go down to the park Or we've asked the out. kids, who do you want to be friends with? You're not obviously friends with them at the moment. Who would you like to be friends with? Why don't we have them over for an afternoon? Yeah, and, and it's a lot easier with younger kids than older kids. But as parents, we can get to know the other families in our kids' classrooms, and that can really help the kids to develop relationships there as well. I, I think the main thing that I would also emphasize is that avoidance reinforces anxiety. So if you've got a child who is struggling with friendships and starting to say, I don't want to go to school, I hate being at school, I don't feel comfortable at school, it's really important that we encourage them to go to school because otherwise when we let them have the day off and then the next day off and then the week off, it feels so affirming, it feels so safe, it feels so nice to not have to go to school that the next time they have to go, it builds even more. It gets yeah. even stronger. It's like that amygdala goes into massive override and the only way it can be released is to be told, I don't have to go, which reinforces the cycle for the next time around. So it's it's really important. While it's okay for kids to have a mental health day now and then, it's really important that our kids are working through these hard things and finding solutions with us, problem solving in and finding options. I think the last thing I'd say is if you're if, if this is a real struggle, including your child's teacher, in this process is really important. There have been times where it has been acknowledged that this is an ongoing issue for a lot of kids in the class. And so as a cohort, they have actually dealt with friendship challenges in a really um, proactive way without singling out specific children. Um, But also your teacher is going to see your child in a totally different light and be able to sometimes... Well, hopefully they'll have a whole lot more empathy and love and and gentleness for that kid and, and, and give them some more support. No, but sometimes they can also kind of add to the picture mm. as well and mm. share things that you are not aware of. That would be helpful. Mm. Podcasts at happyfamilies.com.au. That's podcasts with an S at happyfamilies.com.au. If you would like us to help you with one of those parenting problems that are perplexing you, Karen, we really hope that this has been a helpful response to your email and that it helps you with your 10-year-old. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. And for more about making your family happy, you can visit us at happyfamilies.com.au. 